With Chernobyl at the starting line and Wall Street at the finish, today's book goes all over the map with Securities Exchange Commission, ties to the Russian Mafia, and the all-too-powerful draw of money. Today, my guest and I take a possibly not-so-fictional look at what it means when a company finally goes on the market and all the lives that can get swept up in it on this week's episode of Beyond the Manuscript. But before I get to all that good stuff here, I need to introduce my guest for the week. Joining me today is an expert in corporate branding. He is the author of six influential business books. And here today to talk about his debut novel, Zephyr's War, set to be released on August 13th, now available for pre-order. Please help me in welcoming my guest today, Dr. James Gregory. Thank you, Cooper. Yeah, how are we doing today, James? We're doing well. Very cool. Well, yeah, so I, I heard about the, the premise of your book and where, you know, where it starts off in Chernobyl and then it goes all the way to Wall Street. And I was like, this is a really interesting book. I want to pick your brain and get your opinion and all this other kind of stuff here. But before we really get into that there for the audience at home, um, can you tell us a little bit more about Zephyr's War and what's it about? Sure. Zephyr's War, I, I was always fascinated with Chernobyl and, and the aftermath of, of that uh, incident uh, uh, and how, how did it affect the, the people of the area. And uh, this is a story about two young men who were part of a family that, that uh, grew uh, sunflowers uh, in the shadow of uh, the Zephyr, uh, in the shadow of the Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plant. Well, the two boys were away at uh, Agricultural University with their families uh, when the uh, accident happened. And they were not allowed to return uh, to the exclusion zone. Uh, and uh, their entire families were wiped out. Uh, so the, the farm was, uh, you were not allowed to go back to the farm. The families were had passed away from the, the poisoning of the uh, uh, nuclear energy uh, that had spilled out, and uh, and these two young men were now on their own, and uh, the the brothers uh, Zepp and Ziggy, Zephyr, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they were pretty depressed as you can imagine, and uh, uh, Zepp, the older brother, painted a picture for his younger brother so he wouldn't be so depressed, and the picture he painted is, hey, look. Why don't we do something entirely different? We survived this, so let's do something different. Let's become capitalists. Let's <laughs> drink champagne, smoke cigars. And he breaks off a little twig uh, and pretends he's smoking a cigar with that. And let's go to America and become really wealthy. And that was the plan. And that's what he, that's what he uh, pointed out to, to his brother. And his brother said, okay, let's do that. They shook hands. And everything from there was, uh, they planned to become capitalists in America. And they did a really good job. They got a small settlement for their farm uh, from the uh, uh, Soviet Union and took that settlement and made it to the U.S. and bought a small, small farm there and started rebuilding uh, their base. And uh, it took a number of years for that to, to, to happen. But... Uh, they were true capitalists and, and grew the business, first the farm, then a small industrial company, then a, a, a consumer products company that they became known as Zephyr's Consumer Products. And they launched a, a Wall Street uh, IPO, which is the penultimate uh, concept behind capitalism. Mm -hmm. And along the way, the mafia, uh, the Russian mafia got a sense of this and decided they wanted a piece of the action. So that is that is a synopsis of the story in, in, in a few sentences. Very, very fascinating. Um, so one thing that actually initially drew me to this was the fact that your main characters were planting and growing sunflowers in you know the shadow of, like you said, of a nuclear power plant. And uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, the sunflower is the like international symbol for like cleaning up like nuclear waste so, or, or it's, it's something along those lines because sunflowers themselves 
um, can absorb like nuclear radiation. And so if you plant enough of them, the sunflowers will absorb the latent radiation. And granted, if you look online in uh, the sunflowers near the actual disaster of Chernobyl, they're, they're granted they're mutated, but they're absorbing it and keeping it out of like harm's way and stuff what like that. So he's teased his father saying that we grow the best and the largest uh, uh, sunflowers because we're so close to the plant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's one of those things where, you know, if you, if you think of the Simpsons where it has like that three eyed fish in the water near the right. thing, and I was like, look at this, this is the coolest thing ever. It's definitely not signs of anything whatsoever. <laughs> Speaking of Chernobyl, why did you decide to set that as the starting point in the background of your book? Well, I, I was always fascinated by Chernobyl. I, I uh, gave a, a speech in Kiev, um, uh, a couple of years before the, uh, the the start of the hostilities there between Russia and and uh, uh, Ukraine, mm -hmm. and when I gave that talk, uh, I had a, a tour of the uh, Chernobyl area, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, really was absolutely fascinated by it, and and uh, uh, wondered what happened to the people who survived. You know, what where are they today? What did they do? How how did they how did they overcome this this horrible tragedy? And um, uh, was there life after Chernobyl? And for these people, I built a story around them. The other the other interesting thing about th that um, that conference where I, I spoke in Kiev is. There, I, I noticed the hostilities between the Ukrainian people and the Russian people who were there uh, to uh, monitor the, the conference. It was a conference on corporate branding, and I was able to uh, experience that and, and, uh, and sense the hostilities. Uh, for example, the media, the Russian media wanted to interview me, and my Ukrainian uh, 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 parts, uh, the managers who were managing me didn't want to have that. Uh, didn't want to have them uh, doing a, an interview with me. So mm -hmm. it was just it was just a very interesting dynamic that that uh, I began thinking about that in terms of is there a story here? Can I tell a story mm -hmm. about both both things? Uh, yeah. And uh, and that's what I built it on. Yeah, it is interesting how you're talking about how even, you know, uh, a couple of years before the conflict uh, kicked off, you could already sense that kind of hostility or, like, yeah. you know, that you, you can see that powder keg slowly building uh, as it's filling up to the to the brim there. Like, as I mentioned at the top of the show, that you have already written six influential business books before dipping your toes into the world of fiction. How was it making that transition from, you know, going something that's going to be more informative to, okay, now I need to create people that don't really exist? It was a totally different experience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've, I've written a lot of books on, on the subject of, of corporate branding. Uh, and uh, uh, I became pretty much one of the best known experts on corporate branding. Uh, and uh, as a result, I, I uh, traveled the world giving talks about corporate branding. And uh, what I found with that is that you, I really had to make sure that I not only understood corporate branding, but the things that I was saying about the value of corporate branding, we had to make sure our models were completely accurate and current and, and up to date. Uh, and they became dated very quickly because there were so many people that were, do, you know, coming out with the same sort of books uh, periodically and uh, uh, around that time. And so I had to work very fast and very accurately uh, uh, to keep my reputation up. Uh, and it was it was a it was a tough thing to do. I mean, it was really a lot of pressure, but it worked. And uh, we were. Um, you know, we were very much in demand. Uh, and uh, now making that transition was a whole different <laughs> thing because when you write fiction, anything goes, you know, yeah. and, and, and the more fun it is or the more offbeat it is, the better. And uh, it, you, what you have to do is tie it all together into a story. But boy, is it is it fun! And that one of the interesting things I took a master class on how to write fiction, 
and everyone suggested that that you you know it, it, most people most great authors uh, write an outline for their fiction, mm -hmm. and uh, and you follow that outline and build your story around that. Well, I don't do that. I I write my first sentence of the book, and then I write the second sentence. And if the story doesn't start happening in the first paragraph, I set that aside and start something else. <laughs> so it's really, it's really, you know, it's really a lot of fun writing fiction. It's gotcha. so it, it sounds like you're writing by momentum. Like, okay, like if I get the ball rolling, I, you know, I, as long as it's keep going, you know, as long as it's still spinning, I know I'm in the right direction. Right. Exactly. Uh, so I do want to talk a little bit more about your main character of Zep, where, like, he, like you said, he goes from being a uh, sunflower farmer uh, all the way to, you know, a Wall Street capitalist. And so, um, in your opinion, um, what is going to motivate someone to make such a big shift like that from their lives? Well, I think greed uh, has a lot mm. to do with it. Uh, greed can be a good thing. Uh, it can be a motivator. Uh, uh, what he, what he and uh, uh, his brother were doing, though, were, they were trying to escape uh, this, you know, this mm. horrible thing that happened in their lives, and uh, and so they were motivated by that. But then then money kicked in. I mean, they were making millions of dollars uh, and reselling their business. They resold the farm that they had acquired in, in the US. They s purchased another business and they were able to resell mm -hmm. that. And capitalism is a very positive uh, energy when it's used to, to build uh, your business, you know, to build wealth uh, and to, uh, uh, you know, generate uh, income that for the long term. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, going back to the thing, um, I don't think until like the HBO series called Chernobyl came out, I don't think people had a lot of, you know, visual representation of what life was ba like back then in the USSR in the late 80s, early 90s on, you know, where they had like bread lines and, you know, constant government surveillance and all that kind of stuff. And if you suddenly, you know, if you grow up in that kind of environment and then you're suddenly transported to, you know, like I said, a pretty capitalist America, um, I can kind of see that where if you, you're growing up with kind of like shackles on and then you go to a country where they're, you know, they don't even exist, there's... I can see where there's a kind of like there's no limit to where someone can imagine like, oh, there's there's no limit to how much money I can earn or do this other kind of stuff. Did you see that kind of apply to this kind of like uh, logic yeah, speaking? Absolutely. The the um, Chernobyl for this book is really a, the trigger event. And, mm -hmm. and if if that hadn't happened, they would still be farming uh, yeah. in in the in this in, near the power plant, probably growing bigger sunflowers than ever. But <laughs> but. That was just the trigger event. Once they, once that happened, and they made it to the U.S., they became capitalists. They became saw the opportunities. They had to think through those things. They had to finance them. They had to to build their business ar around that. And and mm -hmm. uh, uh, and and so it 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 was it was a true capitalist success story. Sure. So on, on the beginning part, how much research did you do on like, you know, or early life during that time period and in the place like Chernobyl? Because uh, I know I know from like your probably just regular career, you probably had the more Wall Street side down. But before that, though, like how much research did you do in that time period of like 80s and 90s? Well, as I said, I visited there. I, I've mm -hmm. uh, uh, had the experience of, of getting to know people on both sides. Uh, and uh, to seeing the tension that was developing, uh, and the, um, I, I, I wasn't sure that there was going to be a war specifically, but you could feel the tension to such a degree that it was it was uh, very dramatic and very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, there were demonstrations going on. There were the the president, I for, for, his name slips my mind, but he was poisoned. Uh, mm -hmm. There were you know, constant de demonstrations happening, uh, both pro and con, uh, the independence of Ukraine. Uh, and, um, and so it was, it was a pretty, 
pretty dramatic uh, experience. Gotcha. Uh, and so that, that's, like you said, that takes place closer to the beginning of the book. And then once we get further on, um, you, you're talking about Wall Street and kind of like financial schemes through Wall Street. In your experience, how much of the story actually reflects reality of that? Like, you know, how common are like financial schemes? Well, they're pretty uncommon, actually. Uh, mm. uh, the the, the um, everybody wants the value of their company to maximize the value of their company. Mm. Okay, mm. and the business that I had called corporate branding was built on the concept that if you tell your story, your corporate story, and you tell it well, and there's something special about your corporate story, if it's an interesting story that people are want to know and and can see the opportunity. Uh, for the company to grow, well, that's a that's a good thing, and that's a, that can be told through what we call corporate branding, and we know from from our experience and through uh, various statistical analysis that I that I've done over over time, that it creates value. Just corporate branding alone creates value, and uh, it can be significant value. Uh, so the the main character here is that. Zephyr uh, and the um, the person who's kind of telling the story uh, is uh, ha have a bet that the company is going to create three times the the total value of the uh, IPO mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, brand value. Well, it I won't tell the ending, but it they uh, are are successful in mm -hmm. terms of uh, the, the, the bet, and the bet is pretty, you know, is an interesting stretch for uh, creating value in the company. Gotcha. And so how does the main character of your book reflect your own reality that you've lived through? That's an interesting question. I, I, uh, I've never met anyone quite like Zep Zephyr. Although he's probably an amalgamation of five different clients that I've had over time, <laughs> you know, um, where he's there's one scene where he's he's holding a, a, a he has a, an attaché case filled with money, mm. and he's he's wants to pass it over to uh, uh, Steve Stackhouse, the the character telling the story. He wants to pass it over to him, but he won't take his hand off the off the case. Until until the um, until the, everything's been agreed to, so he has mm. his hand on top of it. Well, that's ex that same thing has happened to me. So I'm, I, mm. everything I I draw from is is there's a little piece that has happened at some point in my life in my career. I think that really makes for the best writing too. I, I think you know if you're able to for lack of a better word, like Frankenstein, bits and pieces of your own life, experiences, knowledge you know, and then to, you know, reassemble them into a really, really good story. I think that's how some of the greatest stories are really created is not so much, you know, pure imagination, but a mixture of imagination and real life, I think. Right. So this is actually an interesting question for you. How, in your opinion, how do we as a society balance the like pursuit of money with something uh, like making sure that we're doing so ethically or morally correct in uh, in a world where it's kind of up to the individual to do so well there the SEC is there to to mm. uh, to provide rules and guidelines for IPOs for example and how how you can communicate with the public if you're a leader in the company or how the company's financial should be reported. There, there's rules and guidelines. Uh, the, the concept of corporate branding is not to break those rules and guidelines. It's to enhance the truth, uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that the truth is told well, to make sure that the, um, uh, the company does not uh, uh, fabricate things, but rather um, you know, that you can build trust, uh, which is trust is the single most important thing in a, in a, uh, between a uh, stockholder and the, the parent company. So uh, what does the title of Zephyr's War signify? And how does the title tie into like the themes and events in the, in the novel? Well, Zephyr's War is uh, indicative of the conflict between uh, capitalism and those who want to
take over capitalism, people who want to uh, destroy it. And there's a lot, there are a lot of naysayers out there. Uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, people who want it, would like to see it destroyed completely. Uh, and <laughs> I have some of them in my family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, sorry about that. I <laughs> shouldn't. No, it's say. okay. It's um, but um, the uh, so Zephyr's War is also indicative of the time frame. You know, it was like right before uh, the 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 war broke out between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it was. Uh, it's also um, the conflict that they had when they faced uh, depression from the result of the Chernobyl disaster. So it was a conflict, a war in his heart as much as it was anything else. Mm. But it gets it gets pretty heated. The ending of the uh, of the book is pretty pretty powerful and unusual, uh, an unusual conclusion. And um, uh, so that's part of the war as well. Gotcha. With time kind of running out on us a little bit here, uh, Jim, um, what are you working on now? Like, you know, this book's coming out um, in August, but what else is like, what else are you working on? Well, we do have uh, quite a bit of momentum right now, and and uh, I have a, a book coming out in December uh, called Killer App, and Killer App oh. is about uh, artificial intelligence and uh, your your your. Uh, the, the most feared ideas behind uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, for example, this is um, uh, the name of this artificial intelligence is, is artificial intelligence made easy or Amy. And uh, Amy uh, embeds herself with this company's computer and begins slowly to take over the company. And Amy is actually speaks and, and communicates perfectly with the uh, with the primary uh, uh, protagonist in the story, and uh, the the what he faces and how he deals with this is very interesting. Especially when Amy uh, tries to interrupt, uh, change his love life, uh, and starts to share information that was that is very very private. So. Mm. Uh, Killer App is is a really fun book. I, I did to make sure I understood um, uh, artificial intelligence. I took a six week course with MIT uh, on on uh, how it works, and and uh, and then plus I use it myself. It's fascinating uh, the, the experiences I've had. So that's a book coming out in December. Uh, with that, there's another book called Artifacts. Um, th these two books will be sold together as one one paperback. Mm. And Artifacts is uh, about uh, I'm, I'm an uh, archaeologist uh, for fun, and uh, I've been taking archaeological uh, courses for years, uh, along with my wife. Both of us do it. But uh, this is a, a um, metal detector that can actually detect the aura of not just the artifact itself, but the aura behind it. So when somebody mm. loses an artifact uh, and it's rediscovered through this metal detector, the aura of that person comes back. So uh, it's a, a really fascinating, it's fun. It's, uh, you know, I, it's, it's really my celebration of the, uh, uh, of the no holds barred kind of fiction writing <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that, yeah. that I really like. Very cool. Well, when the, when those books come out, I'd love to have you back on the show to talk about those uh, as great. well. Yeah, cool. Um, well, that's going to do it for this week here on Beyond the Manuscripts here. Please go pick up your copy of Zephyr's War, set to be released on August 13th, but available now for pre-order. I want to thank my guest, James Gregory, for coming on the show here. Beyond the Manuscripts, of course, is powered by Manuscripts, where you never write alone. James, thank you again one more time for coming on the show. Thank you. It's been my pleasure.